Moody Bible Institute was founded in 1886 by Dwight Lyman Moody to train believers to proclaim Jesus Christ here in the city of Chicago as well as around the world. I chose the study at Moody to take advantage of its top level education in the Bible as well as its tuition paid education. Being at a school like Moody, you have the incredible opportunity to be able to sit under the guidance and leadership of some of the best professors in the world. And that's an incredible opportunity for you to grow as a young Christian as well as a future leader in the church. I chose to study at Moody because I had always desired to have a Christian education. And as I was researching and looking at different schools, um, the one thing that stuck out about Moody was how outward focused they were. While they give you a biblical education, their focus is that you would go teach and train the world, not just keep it for yourself. When I think of students looking back on their Moody experience, I want them to think that this was the most impactful time of their life in regard to the knowledge that they obtained in the classroom, the leadership skills that they developed, their relationships, and most importantly, their walk with Christ. I hope that they can look back and think that they fell more in love with Christ because they were moved by the Institute. And the legacy that I would love to leave with my students is this, that there is no greater calling than investing in the next generation. There's not something better along the path. This is not a stepping stone. This is it. This is ministry, and it's worth it everything it costs. Oklahoma Christian University is a big backyard full of discoveries, your heart-stretching, adventure-packed, soul-filling stomping grounds. 2,500 students strong, nestled in the heart of a big league city, rising up from the plains. Unflinchingly Christian, undeniably top tier. We are scholars perfecting the pursuit of truth, seekers searching for answers to questions most people are afraid to ask, servants expanding the borders of the kingdom, living Jesus loud on our campus, in our city, and around the world. This is one of the life-savingest, kingdom-buildingest, world-changingest groups of young people this side of eternity. OC is home. Well, good morning to you all. Good morning to you all. There we go. It's a little bit better. I am from upstate New York. How many of you heard of New York City? Great. I'm not from there. I am from a different part of the state. There is more to the state than New York City. Many people don't realize that. I'm from the great city of Rochester, which I just learned the other day that actually is one of the second or third um, largest cities in terms of the amount of snow that we get per year. I didn't realize that. I thought it was normal to walk to school in snow that was this high, but apparently it's not. Things that you learn as you uh, continue on in life here. My name is Alicia, for those of you who've never met me, which is pretty much all of you. Uh, I now live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I spend my life talking with people about reasons why I think Christianity is true. In other words, a very big thing for me is engaging our mind. A big thing for me is for us to think through why we believe certain things to be true. And I'll talk with you a little bit later about some of my story. But a topic on engaging our mind is something that is very, very dear to me. Because I think it's very important as I travel around and I encounter so many different college students. 
I recognize how important it is for us to think through what we believe in. But first, important things. Quick social media break. I have resisted being on Twitter for a very long time because I'm not a twit. However, our social media person at my job is a good friend of mine, and it would make her very happy if you would follow me on Twitter. So if any of you, I guess it's not up there anymore, but if any of you would like to follow me, you see my name in your program, just add the numbers 88. There it is. That will keep our friendship alive and strong. So if you could help me out, that would be great. But I know none of you have your phone, so I'm sure you're not, you know, doing any of that now. But, um, but thank you. I would really appreciate it. And you'll see I'll tweet things about cute dogs and puppies and kids and sports and all that kind of stuff. Just want to say really quickly, I know this has been a very tough week here in Texas as the rest of America prays with you and, and looks on about the, the shooting, the church shooting that happened uh, very recently. You are in our thoughts and you are in our prayers. It is something that many of us around America have been affected by, not just because of what's happened here, but because of things that have happened in our own neighborhoods. And so I just want you to know that you are loved and cared for by many of us around. A little bit about me. I, I've lived in Boston for the last four years, just recently moved to Atlanta. And in Boston, there are a lot of universities. How many of you ever heard of Harvard? Okay, MIT, Boston University, Boston College. Okay, good. So you guys know Boston is full of universities. They say about one out of every four students or people in Boston is a student. One out of every four is a student. And one thing I learned by speaking at so many different universities is that people, students, really are not all that opposed to you talking about religion. They're not all that opposed to you talking about Christianity as long as you have something intellectual, some kind of solid foundation from which you're speaking on. So if you go to somebody and say, hey, I'm a Christian because somebody gave me a book one day and I believe in it, you're going to lose all credibility. But if you go to them and say, hey, I'm a Christian because I know there's a lot of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or you're saying, I'm a Christian because I've looked at the evidence for the Bible and the manuscripts and I see it as completely credible. Now they're willing to talk with you and now they're willing to engage with you. And so engaging your mind gets you very far in an atmosphere where people are anti-God but are very pro-thinking. Very pro-thoughtful and reasoned arguments. And so you, as students, need to know why you believe. Pretty soon you will graduate high school, middle school, you will go on to college and your objections, or sorry, you will be faced with objections, your beliefs will be questioned. And when people say, why do you believe? You need to know why. When people say, how do you know it's true? You need to know how. So today what I want to look at is how do we engage our mind? I'm going to look at why we engage, how we engage, and then I want to look at some popular common objections I hear, to about, hear about Christianity and see how we can engage with somebody who is bringing those arguments to us. Now, engaging our mind is not something new, guys. Okay, this is something we do all the time. You do it at school. You do it at home. You do it out in society. We are always thinking and engaging our mind. And we use our minds to help us know what makes sense. To show you what I mean... I want to take you, show you some outdated laws and show you how we engage our mind with everything that happens, even in normal day society. These are real laws, okay? It is forbidden to fish while sitting on a giraffe's neck. I hope that you guys now feel better knowing that you won't break that law the next time you go fishing. Another law, while riding in an elevator, one must talk to no one and fold his hands while looking toward the door. Probably what you do anyways, but who knew that that was actually a law? How about this one? A person may not walk around on Sundays with an ice cream cone in his or her pocket. Whoa. How many of you have broken that law, that good old ice cream cone in the pocket trick? Yeah, right? Let's look at this one. Slippers are not to be worn after 10 p.m. <laughs> It is illegal not to drink milk. Oh, well, that's good to know. 
And finally, or sorry, two more, it is against the law to fish from horseback. So not only you can't fish while sitting on a giraffe's neck, you also can't fish on horseback. And how about this last one? Birds have the right of way on all highways. Now, we laugh at these laws. Why? Because we're engaging our minds and our thoughts, and we realize how silly some of these things are. Okay? If somebody was to say, you can't engage with the, you can't, um, you have to give the right of way to a bird, we would find that to be silly. Okay? So we engage our mind at many, many times in our life. It is not just about Christianity. But here's what's great about Christianity. Engaging your mind with Christianity is a part of loving God. So why should we engage? Well, number one, we engage our minds so that we know why we love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Engaging our mind is another expression of loving him. When we engage our mind, it helps us to know why we believe. When somebody says to you, why are you a Christian, you have an answer. And I don't mean what's your testimony, what's your story, how you came to know Jesus. That's not what I'm asking. Why Christianity? There's Hinduism, there's atheism, there's Buddhism. Why Christianity? Why are you a Christian? That is a popular question that people ask me. When we engage our mind, we'll know how to handle challenges raised against Christianity. But we also want to engage their mind, meaning we want to engage the minds of the people we are talking to or that we are engaging with. When people want to ask questions about Christianity, when they're interested in Christianity, they want to know, does Christianity answer the life questions that I'm asking about why I'm here, how I live, how I got here. They want to know that they can bring their intellect into their religion and not leave it at the door. So engaging our mind helps people to realize that Christianity is something that they can embrace with their whole mind. So how do we do this? How do we engage? You may laugh at the first one, but this is a story of my life. Talking to yourself. In other words, don't just read something out of the Bible, friends. Think about it. Think about what Christianity teaches. Does it actually make any sense? This whole Jesus dying on a cross thing, huh? How do you explain that? How do you process through that? Consider how you can explain Christianity to anybody who is unclear about something it teaches. What does it mean to be saved? All of these big words we use. But I also want to encourage you in something that I see as a major problem here in our society today. I want to encourage you to engage yourself and to challenge dominant ideas. You need to challenge dominant ideas. What do I mean by that? Just because society says something is true or is good doesn't mean it is. Just because society says something doesn't mean it's true. What are the arguments on both sides of an issue? Don't let society tell you guys what to believe. Begin to think for yourself. Believe it or not, as much as you may or may not like math, this is a big thing that math does for you. It isn't always just about the numbers. Math teaches you critical thinking skills. You can't say 2 plus 2 equals 4 if you can't show me how. And it forces you to have to understand why you say something is true and not just say it. Think it through. Do not let society tell you what to believe or tell you what is true. Truth isn't necessarily popular opinion. But we also need to talk to other people when we are engaging. Friends, teachers, any questions you have, run them by your peers. Talk to different people. Say, I'm not sure about this. What do I do about this? And make sure that you're a person. That when somebody says, hey, I'm not sure about this whole Christianity thing. I kind of don't know if I think it's true. I'm doubting it. Or maybe it's somebody who isn't a Christian and they have questions. Make sure you're somebody that they can go to. 
are you somebody that they can actually ask their questions to? And another point I really want to emphasize with you, which is counter to society today, is I would encourage you to engage in thoughtful discussion with people who disagree with you. Don't just sit there and listen to people who are on the same side of you in regards to a particular argument or a particular belief. That doesn't help you strengthen what you believe in and it doesn't make you question what you believe in. You need to engage in thoughtful discussion. People who say that, hey, I think this whole God thing is crazy. Great, tell me why. You're my new best friend. Use your critical thinking skills. Good, healthy dialogue where people are encouraged to be honest in their thoughts and opinions is enriching for you. Listen to what other people believe in. And I'm telling you, you will find more confidence in Christianity. When I talk to different people, in fact, I have a whole talk I do on why I'm not an atheist. And a lot of that talk, a lot of the things I say in that talk as why I'm not an atheist, are things that I've learned in discussions with atheists where their atheism has failed them. And so even though they're an atheist, they find these issues in their belief system. And it only strengthens my resolve to why I'm never going to be an atheist. When you engage with other people, you learn all the faults of their belief system. And you can help them to see the truth in Christianity. And I know it's a bad word to say, but it's study. You need to study. And I don't mean study the latest Facebook post or 140 or 280 Twitter character posts. But I mean actually read from a credible source. Newsflash, guys, everything we see on social media actually isn't a reliable source of information. Everything you Google is not a reliable source of information. How do you know that the person who wrote that article on this random website actually knows what they're talking about? And isn't a five-year-old with really good language skills? You can't just believe everything that you read unless it comes from a source that you can actually trust. Read the Bible. Allow the Bible to direct you to teach you about the world that you live in. It is very relevant even for today. When people say there's no meaning to life, which is something I'm hearing a lot more often, this fact of just depression and loneliness and feeling like this is all there is, there's no reason to get up in the morning. Read Ecclesiastes. They wrote about that thousands of years ago. It's not new. So now that I've looked at a little bit of how to engage, I'm going to show you a list of popular questions, popular objections that I hear in regards to Christianity. Take a look at these. See if they're, and out of these, see how many are surprising to you, are interesting to you? What have I left out? What have you heard? Which ones do you struggle to answer? Which ones, if somebody asked you about, would you struggle to respond to? Many of these are not easy. And it would be beneficial for you to consider taking time to look through some of them. To look through some of the major reasons why people resist Christianity. And many of them have to do with these reasons right here. At some point in your life, I know you may not believe this, but you too will probably question Christianity. If you haven't done it yet, it will probably come up at some point. I grew up in a Christian home. I was one of those kids who went to youth group. I went to Sunday school. We went to church Sunday morning, went to church Sunday evening. I had my little Our Daily Breads. I would read. And then I went to college. And I went to a Christian college. And at this Christian college, we had to take a Bible course. Two, Old Testament, New Testament. And it was in this Bible course, in this Christian college, with this amazing Christian professor, that I began to question and doubt everything I'd ever believed in when it came to Christianity. 
And in that one short, tiny class period, not the semester long class, but that one class period, listening to what the teacher was teaching about the Bible and how the Bible came together. I remember sitting there thinking, there is no way that there is a God. And in that short 35, 40 minute class, it completely erased 18 years of Christian education and a Christian learning in my life. And I walked out that class saying there is no God. I remember walking back to my dorm, looking at the grass, looking at the trees, looking at the sky and being like, this is it. This is all there is. There's nothing bigger. There's nothing greater. It's just earth. The wow factor was gone. The beauty factor was gone. But now who was I going to tell? I'm, a, I'm in the gospel choir at the college. I'm one of the people that people come to for prayer. I couldn't tell a soul. And so I didn't. I didn't tell a single person. And I went on for several weeks, however long it was, for a period of time, thinking that there is no God. And I remember sitting there and saying, okay, Alicia, after a certain amount of time had passed, if you want to say there's no, there's no God or that Christianity isn't true, that's fine. But you have to come up with another explanation for certain experiences and certain questions that you have in your life. It's one thing to say there is no Christian God, that's fine. But that doesn't mean all of these questions about how did we get here? How do we explain Jesus? How do we explain experiences in your life where you prayed something and, and somebody answered that prayer? A prayer that nobody knew about, but yet that prayer was answered. You have to come up with alternative explanations. See, guys, saying Christianity isn't true doesn't mean that atheism is. Saying Christianity isn't true doesn't mean Islam is. All that means is Christianity isn't true. But you still have to find another answer to all of these questions. And so I was left in this situation where it's like, okay, I don't have another explanation for this. Christianity answers all of this over here. So maybe I'll give Christianity a second thought. Maybe I'll give it another chance. And spoiler alert, I became a Christian. Again, no surprise there. I walked right back into my faith. If you haven't had a moment of doubt, friends, you will. A moment when you need to really know why you believe. And you know what? There's many ways in which we can respond to doubt. Because the reality is that people believe things for a variety of different reasons. Whether it's experience, whether it's evidence, whether it's logic. Maybe some people believe in a God because they're afraid of the afterlife. Whatever the reason is, the point is that when one of those things are challenged, we now don't know what to do with ourselves. And so some people may feel ashamed or embarrassed like I was. I couldn't tell anybody. And we kind of just say, okay, well, one day maybe I'll figure it out. But right now I'm just going to kind of pretend that I, I, I know and, and, I, and we'll just see what happens. Maybe when I'm older, when I'm 50 or 60, then I'll figure it out. And we kind of live in this world where we're not really following truth, but we're not really not following truth. And we kind of are just hovering. Living in the agnostic world, the world that says, I don't know whether or not there's a God. I don't know if there's any way we'll ever know. But that world isn't livable. Some people can just say, well, I'm doubting, I'm not sure, and so we walk away. Say, so forget this whole thing. But we never, if we choose to walk away, we are saying, I never want to pursue what truth is. Because remember, walking away doesn't make God disappear if he is there. If he's there, he's there whether or not you believe in him. So if walking away doesn't bring you any closer necessarily to truth. Or we can do what eventually I did is we can begin to search for answers. And this is where engaging our mind comes into play. One of the things that I love about Christianity is that it's a belief system that encourages me to question. You can't do that with every religion. Some religions, if you question, it's very, very bad. And God knows that you're questioning him. And it's a bad check in your bad deed category. Christianity embraces it. So we can use doubt 
and our minds to strengthen our understanding of Christianity and bring us into a deeper understanding of what reality actually is. So what I want to do now is take you on a little walk with me through two popular objections that I hear about Christianity, against Christianity. One I hear is all religions lead to God. Haven't you ever heard this? This idea that all religions lead to God. Have any of you ever heard somebody say that before? Okay. How about this other idea? The God of the Old Testament, he just seems pretty horrible. How can you believe in a God that commands genocide? How many of you ever heard of that one? Okay. So I want to take a look through you, take a look with you through these questions and see how we can engage our mind to answer some of these questions. So let's say somebody says to you, hey, you know what? All religions are the same. All religions lead to God. It's just as if people are climbing up a mountain, right? Some people go straight, some people go crooked, some people go up and back. But the idea is that we're all, we're just all on a pathway. And we're just all going to reach to God. No matter which path you take, it all gets there. Well, if we wanted to engage this person who was saying this stuff to us with our minds, how could we respond? Well, one thing we could say to this person, or one thing we could first consider, is why would they, why would they even say this? Why would they ask this question? For some people, it's compassion. They say all religions lead to God because they don't come from a Christian family. They have some Muslims in their family. They have some Hindus in their family. And they have Christians. And these are all really good, loving people. They live really good lives. So they're all going to get there. One reason why people say this is because they have compassion for those that are around them. Another thing we could do is ask the person, well, how do you know that? How do you know all the paths lead to God? How do you know that they're, everybody's on the same pathway? In other words, question the question. Make them think through why they think that's a good question. Now we could also show errors or ways in which this question has flaws. For example, when somebody says that all the pathways are leading to God, what are they assuming is at the top of that mountain? They're assuming that there is a God as opposed to no God, but they're also assuming that whatever that God is, is somehow going to fit into all the different religions. But see, that's a problem. Because Judaism, Islam, and Christianity say there's one God. Hinduism says there's 30, 300 million gods. So is it one God or is it millions of gods? And even in the three monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we don't even agree on what that God looks like. In, in, in Islam, it's, it's a Unitarian God. In Christianity, it's a Trinitarian God. So what's up there, guys? So we can begin to show them that, hey, you know what? There might be some flaws in this question that you aren't thinking about. All the religions can't be merged because they teach different things. We can also show them that what they specifically, when they say, ask this question, what they specifically believe about God doesn't matter at all. doesn't matter if you think there's millions of them or one. What you believe about them doesn't matter. If you believe Jesus is divine or he's not, it doesn't matter. Just believe whatever you want to believe, and you're all going to end up in God, with the God anyways. Well, that's interesting. Because doesn't belief matter, guys? When there was a, let's say there was a big party this past Saturday at somebody's house, and it was really bad, and the police came, and you told your mom that you were going to be studying that night with your friend, which you were. You were not there. When your mom questions you today and says, hey, were you at that party? Does it matter to you whether or not she believes you when you say you weren't? Doesn't belief matter? It absolutely does. What you believe is true matters. And you can also show somebody the danger in believing that the way that they do. When you tell me that all religions lead to God, then you know what you're telling me? Then I need to be an encourager of all religions. But the problem with that for me is that not all religions teach things that I think they should. I just came back from India just about a month ago. I've been there several times. 
When you go to a place like that, you learn about social classes and social structures in a way that's different than what we have here. People are proud of their social class. They think they deserve to be in their lower class or their upper class. It's okay to look down on somebody or okay to look up on somebody based on their social class. If I say that all religions lead to God, then I'm saying, hey, your social structure, that's completely okay. I can encourage that Hinduism. For someone who's a Muslim and they, feel, they are afraid as to whether or not they will ever be accepted by God because their good deeds have to outweigh their bad deeds in order for them to get into paradise. They live in this constant sense of fear. Did I do enough good today? How, many, how much bad did I do? When I say all religions lead to God, then I have to encourage them to live in that life of fear. I don't want to tell people all religions lead to God because that's not helpful for them. So do you see how when we engage our mind with a question or with a thought, it helps us understand the what and the why we believe in what we believe? It allows us to help ourselves and others think through belief, and it also paves the way for them to see Jesus. So perhaps, friends, our response to this question, once we've helped people process through some of this, perhaps our response to this question can be, actually, I think it's good that Jesus is the only way to God. You know why? Because if Jesus is the only way to God, it means that you don't have to worry about earning your way to heaven. It means that you could be accepted even with your faults and your sins and your failures. It means that you don't have to serve a God who only loves you because of the good that you can do. And if Jesus is the only way to God, which is what Christianity teaches, then it also means this whole mountain example, guys, you're trying to climb so hard, you're trying to find the right pathway, you're trying to do all the right things. What Christianity teaches is, you know what? Stop climbing. You'll never get there. That's why in Christianity, God comes down. And he comes down that mountain. Now, I think that's a much be more beautiful way to enter into a relationship with God, to believe God, to know God. Stop climbing and try and make your way to him. He's already come down so that you can make your way to him. Let's look at one more example of how we can engage our minds by dealing with this topic of who is this God in the Old Testament? This evil, mean, vindictive monster in the Old Testament compared to this loving, kind, gentle Jesus in the New. How do we deal with this? You Christians believe in two completely different gods. Well, if we want to engage our minds, once again, how can we approach this question? Well, like we did the last time, let's think about why somebody would say this. One of the big reasons why people ask this question is because they're trying to sort out whether or not the Christian God is good. If he's good in the New Testament and he's evil in the Old, then he really isn't good. If he's not good, then he's not perfect. If he's not perfect, then I don't want to serve him. This is all about the character of God, this question. How is it that I can serve a God who seems inhumane? So we can think about why is somebody asking this question? And we can also ask them, well, tell me, how is the God of the Old Testament different to the God of the New Testament for you? You say they're different gods. What do you mean by that? When you ask that kind of question, you're forcing people to have to think about, huh, well, what do I really know about the New Testament? Have I ever read the Bible? What do I know about the Old Testament? Have I ever read that? We can also posit a hypothetical question back. Is it possible that God was justified in what he asked people to do? So maybe when people say he was a horrible monster in the Old Testament, we'll say, well, is it possible that he was actually justified? Is that something we can consider? We can ask people, hey, you seem upset about what God asked the Israelites to do in the Old Testament. But what were the people doing that made God think, it was, think he was completely warranted and justified to punish them? In other words, begin to ask people, 
why they think what they're saying is true. How do they know what they're saying is true? What research have they done? What evidence have they gathered? How do they know that their accusation against Christianity is actually valid? Now, some people look at the Old Testament and say, well, it encouraged slavery. Well, it may sound silly, but ask them, well, what about slavery makes you upset? How do you know it's wrong? How do you know it's unjust? What do you think of when you think of slavery? Ask them what their image is. What do they visualize? Now, why do we do this before we answer the question? Because it helps us once again to make somebody begin to realize, hmm, maybe I've responded emotionally to something and I have not responded intellectually to something. Maybe I have not thought it through or done the research. But yet I have this feeling or hold this belief. So let's look at this question about God in the Old Testament. Is he indeed a monster? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say I say to you that a um, 15-year-old girl clenches her fist and slugs some guy in the face. Okay? Now, you're thinking one thing about this girl. You're not really sure what, like, should I root for her? Should I be upset with her? Like, I don't know, power to you, but I don't know, right? But what if I said to you, this 15-year-old was being bullied by this guy for four years. She finally was fed up with it, and she turned around, and she just socked him one good. Now how do you feel about what she did? Now you're like, okay, right? I mean, no, we don't, we don't condone violence. Violence isn't good. I'm like, yeah, right. Okay, right. Right? But in other words, what happened? When I give you more of the story, it helps you to better understand what was actually happening. If I don't give you the story, you can't really tell what's right or wrong. But once I give you more of it, the background that you know she's bullied, well, now you see that story is different. Now you see her actions, her punch as different. And this is the same way we need to approach things in the Old Testament and things in the Bible and in Christianity in general. You can't open up a book, guys, read one sentence and think you know what the whole book says. You have to do the background work behind it. And there is more work to do, especially when it comes to some of these things in the Old Testament. So let me give you a little bit of a picture as to what was happening here. First of all, God waited about 400 years until the sin of the people, the Canaanites, was so bad. It was then that he was justified in punishing them. So what were they doing, Alicia, that was so bad? Well, what they were doing, first of all, they had idols that they worshipped. Okay, so they worshipped other gods. Really, that was that bad? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about what they were doing. Remember, the object that you worship affects your life and how you live. It's not just that you worship something, it affects how you live. And so in their culture, it was okay for brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and mothers and children to have sexual relations with each other because of the gods that they worshipped. It was okay for men to be unfaithful in marriage. The women couldn't be, but the men could be. And he could engage in prostitution and other sexual endeavors because that was okay in that culture and that time. But of course, every religion encourages worship, doesn't it? And one of the ways in which they would worship was through child sacrifice. And these people, what they do, they had a, a stone statue of their God with its arms outstretched. And they would take an infant and they would lay it across the arms. They would light a fire below it, strike up a band that would play very loudly, and burn the child alive. And the band would cover the sounds of the child screaming. Now, when you understand the background, it makes you wonder, huh, maybe God would be a monster if he didn't intervene. Maybe God was actually doing something good. Now that I see a bigger picture, now that I've done the research, now that I've engaged my mind, now that I've thought through this, maybe I actually can find justification and actually be grateful that God 
intervened. But what about this whole idea of slavery, right? I hear this all the time. The Bible encouraged slavery, encouraged slavery. Really did it? See, the problem is, guys, is that we think of slavery as what happened in America. And we project that thinking into every other time we read the word slavery. But slavery in the biblical times was different. Sure, they had very similar slavery to what we had, but that wasn't what God was encouraging his people to do. He was calling them out of a society that was oppressive and saying, hey, I actually want you to treat slaves in a different way than what you've been treating them. Slavery was voluntary. If I owed you something, if I did something to you and I couldn't pay you back, what I would do would be to say, hey, I will work for you for a certain amount of years, and then I'll pay, and that will help me to pay, pay you back. You couldn't work for somebody more than seven years, nor could I work seven days a week. So my max was seven years, and I could only work six days a week. And you know what I got in return from you? Food, clothing, and shelter. That's very different than the American slave trade. When we look at this whole idea of um, how people were treated, right? How were slaves actually treated? Well, you know what? If a slave was abused, they were to be freed under God's laws. If a slave was um, kidnapped, that was punishable by death. If a slave ran away and was freed, you were not allowed to return them. What God did was put boundaries around an existing and immoral institution and saying, actually, you cannot treat people the way that you have been. And you know what some slaves did even after the seven years were up and they were free? They voluntarily stayed for life. Why? Because they got food, clothing, and shelter. It was a voluntary thing. This is what happens when we are able to engage our mind and think deeper. We are able to better understand why things happened the way they did. I want to share with you one quick story. Let's say you're outside. Let's say you're about four or five years old. And you're outside um, playing with a ball. And your ball rolls into the street. Okay? Four or five-year-olds see what? Ball, street. So you see that ball in the street and you immediately want to go and you start to dart for that street. Your mother, who is up in the house looking down, sees what you're doing and she says, stop. Why does she scream stop? Because while you see ball, your mother sees cars. Right? Now you're angry with her. Mom, why are you telling me to stop? What are you doing? My ball's in the street. What's wrong with you? Don't you see that the ball is in the street? And your mom says, yes, I do see the ball is in the street. But the problem is that you don't see what I see. All you see is the ball. You don't see the cars. You don't see the danger that is going to happen. We engage our minds, friends, because we want to help people see what we see when it comes to to Christianity. It may not make sense. They may not understand it. But when we help them to engage with our minds, we help them to realize the full picture of Christianity. They are then better able to see things as we do. So think deeper about your faith. Embrace a close relationship with the Lord. But also embrace loving him with your mind. When you run across questions that you can't answer, don't worry. There's questions I still can't answer. But there's also answers for a lot of the questions that you have. As I travel on this world, as I go from university campus to high school campuses to adult conferences, it's the same questions. When you go back 2,000 years, it's the same questions being asked. There are answers to the questions that you have. Engage the mind with your friends to help them see truth. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Alicia. We're going to take a uh, quick four-minute stretch break.